Transparency and more focus on consumer understanding and fair dealing will surely help to facilitate sounder behavior. Now, you know, in making the case for reform and the importance of regulatory reform to, to families, I think policymakers often focus in on just the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. And it is unquestionably important. But while capital requirements and resolution authority and derivatives may sound very far removed from everyday life, they are also essential. You know, the central goal of regulatory reform is to prevent future crises and their attendant fallout on tens of millions of workers, homeowners, and businesses. Thus, all of regulatory reform is about protecting ordinary Americans. Preventing future financial crises is just simply something that we owe ourselves and we owe to future generations. If there is anything that the last two years have taught us, it's that a well-functioning financial system is important to us all. When the financial system melts down, as it did in the fall of 2008, it's not just Wall Street bankers that feel the pain. Right? Fir you know, firms can't get loans to buy materials or cover payroll. As a result, production grinds to a halt and workers are laid off. Families can't get credit to buy cars or houses or put their children into co through college. And as a result, auto sales plummet, housing construction ceases, and dreams are put on hold. We've lost more than 8 million jobs, largely because of the fallout from the financial crisis. None of us ever wants to live through this again. To prevent it, we need sensible rules of the road that encourage responsible behavior, protect consumers, increase transparency, and build in mechanisms for keeping pace with financial innovation. This is what the President is working with Congress to draft. As the Senate begins to debate financial regulatory reform, there are surely going to be lots of twists and turns in the legislative process. The administration will work with lawmakers to hold the line on preventing loopholes and ensuring that the bill prevents both irresponsible practices and bailouts. The President will insist on genuine reform that holds financial firms accountable. He'll also not hesitate to stand up against changes to the plan that may sound tough at first, but in fact leave the system more vulnerable than it is now. He will take the heat if it means we end up with a better bill. Because at the end of the day, what matters is that we create a new regulatory framework that makes this financial system safer. You know, over the last year, I've, I've used lots of, of medical analogies. I, I suppose it's only natural when the economy has been uh, as sick as it has been. I think this time last year, I gave a speech on the diagnosis and treatment of our economic ills. Last fall, I gave a, a talk on how close we came to the brink of disaster. I guess you could say I was describing our near-death experience. This year, in describing the economy, I have the feeling of a doctor looking at a once deathly ill patient with a new sense of hope. The patient is weak to be sure, but clearly recovering. He's going to make it. The economy is going to make it. This means that our short-term focus can shift from crisis management to working to do all that we can to make the recovery as speedy as possible. It also means that it's time for us to start looking forward to prevention. Just as with a patient who's coming back from a heart attack, we need to do not only all we can to hasten the recovery, we need to make important lifestyle changes that will keep that patient healthy in the future. The trauma of the past two years has shown us just how horrible the fallout from a financial crisis can be. We need to put in place good financial regulatory reform to safeguard us against a repeat. We must take what we've learned and channel it into a stronger and more secure financial system and a better future for us all. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a special forum featuring Dr. Christina Romer, Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. We will return to our speaker in a moment for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions now and remind you to keep them brief and to the point. We welcome you to the City Club Forum. For those listening to today's forum through one of our broadcast partners, we want to remind you that all are welcome here at the City Club Forums. Please visit our website to see a full schedule of our upcoming programs. Our greetings go to those present in this room, especially to our guests. 
We hope you will join the City Club and become active in our ongoing civic dialogue. This Friday, May 7th, the City Club will host Frederick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. On Monday, May 10th, we welcome Cuyahoga County Commissioner Peter Lawson Jones, who will discuss the state of the county. For more information about our forums and events, or to make a reservation, please refer to the back of your printed program or visit our website, cityclub.org. To order a DVD of today's program, please call the City Club at 1-888-223-6786 or at 216-621-0082. We welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler, Cleveland Marshall College of Law, Cuyahoga Community College, Deloitte, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, Fund for Our Economic Future, Key Bank, Medical Mutual of Ohio, PNC Bank, Porter Wright Morris and Arthur LLP, Thompson Hine LLP, and Western Reserve Partners LLC. Thank you for joining us today. We are pleased to welcome to our forum students who are here as part of our City Club student program. Participation of these students is made possible by a generous grant from Robert Weisberger. Today, we welcome students from Design Lab and Students of Promise from John Marshall High School. Will the students please stand and be recognized? <clears throat> now, we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are City Club Special Projects Coordinator Lauren Sable, Lauren, and PR and Programs Manager Carrie Miller. First question, please. Yes. Uh, well, how, the way that you decided what that we were having serious problems a couple years ago was to look at uh, mortgage packages. I think that that is reasonable. And the way you went about evaluating them to see what had happened was by marking to the market. And again, that's the statistics that you're well aware of. The only problem with that was that when you looked for a quote on one of those packages, typically these were so diverse and so particular to each package that in order to evaluate a package, you had to give the QCIP number for it. Marking to the market then could not really be something that was accurate because there was no market for these things. If you have to ask the QCIP number, there ain't. <laughs> Would you explain? Would you explain how that happened? Why they went to that thing, and then what did they do to try to straighten it around? All right. Well, I think the first thing to say, is certainly in terms of uh, how did we know we were in this mess, right? So we had lots of other signs, right? So there was the, obviously the freezing up of our credit markets, the skyrocketing of credit spreads and the ultimate indicator of what's happening to production and employment. And that certainly um, were, were very strong signs of just uh, how severe uh, this crisis was. I think what your question gets to is, you know, it really feeds into everything I was saying about why it's so important to do financial regulatory reform. And, right, what you're really talking about is financial innovation, right? We had the rise of products that were so different than what anyone had ever envisioned in 1933 or 1935 when we're starting to put in place most of our regulatory framework. And it's exactly, you know, the innovation outside the regulatory framework. I think the other thing you're pointing out is the lack of transparency, right? Not knowing what the value of these things are, you know, exposes both regulators don't know uh, what they're regulating about and participants in the market don't know just how exposed various institutions were. 